I would like to start by addressing those of you who are still afraid of bees. I know you're out there, and I understand. However, we're past that. And I know there's a part of you that knows this too. We need to acknowledge the importance of bees and that these are not things to fear because bees are dying. They were dying yesterday, they're dying today, and unless we do something, they will continue dying tomorrow. We don't want to avoid our future only because we don't understand it. And the more you understand about bees, the better our future can be. Now, since 2012, I was thrown onto the global platform as an urban beekeeper, which I certainly am. It's been an experience that I'm very grateful for. It has provided me with basically an avenue through which to communicate my own research progress. My funding model is a bit unique. I went rogue in graduate school, started my own company with a Facebook page and a dream to start a laboratory. But I looked around, and since I had no money and no laboratory, I started it in my living room, in my Boston apartment. And since then, I figured, uh, okay, this grant funding situation isn't going so well, so maybe I'll start selling beehives, and I'll volunteer my time to manage those beehives for residents, for businesses, for schools, for anybody who wants a beehive but doesn't really want to manage it themselves. Since then, five years later, we have managed to bring in hundreds of thousands of dollars of research funds. We're no longer in my living room apartment. It's no longer just me either. We've got a great team of 17 beekeepers. We have student researchers. We have postdocs. We have a great group. We also have our own van, right? <laughs> We're no longer bringing bees on the subway in Boston. <laughs> It's progress. <laughs> We're no longer moving bees through the city in zip cars. Thank you, zip car. <laughs> but we've moved on, and we've moved forward, and we are moving forward together. Now, another thing we're doing is we are working with citizens. We are educating tirelessly to educate everybody about bees. This is a swarm of bees on a yellow car in the heart of Dorchester. This is actually the neighborhood of Boston where I live too, but it's not a place where you might expect to see maybe 50,000 bees land on a car. We've been working with people at City Hall, Animal Control, the police, to just give us a call if this ever happens, and that's what they do now. We work with citizens and municipalities so that we can then send our team from the Best Bees Company out with a box and a brush, and we'll just gently brush the bees into the box, looking around at all the townspeople. Like, <laughs> you know, we do do this every day. I realize you might not see this every day, but it's routine for us. They're not aggressive. These are pollinators, right? This is where our food comes from, and this is how we fund our research. We bring these swarms of bees back to the bee sanctuary. It's a fancy name for the parking lot where my laboratory is, <laughs> right? So the Urban Beekeeping Laboratory, as my lab is called, is right next to Boston Medical Center. Not on purpose, but super convenient, just in case. <laughs> Remember, these are not aggressive, so we don't have to worry about that, and we've never had to. It's just a joke there. However, <laughs> in our parking lot, we have hydraulic lifts that bring beehives overhead when they're not in use, and they can lower them down when we do need to use them. We're trying to innovate here with different solutions for funding research, doing research, engaging the public. On one hand side, we have a hotel rooftop that has eight beehives here in Boston. They use the honey in the restaurant. Fresh ingredients. It doesn't get more local than your own backyard or your rooftop. We have most of the hotels in Boston as our clients. We even see hotel brands globally that require their properties to get bees. In Boston, some of those property managers have phoned us to say, well, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> we'll help them out. We also work with real estate agents and other residents to have innovative solutions for how to integrate pollinators into our everyday lives. So how about this floating beehive here that is high up above Ahab's head, keeping them both at a safe distance. They're all fine together. 
Now, also since the 2012 TEDx Boston talk, I had the opportunity to engage with the global community in answering many questions, and I got to write this all down in a book called The Bee, A Natural History. It's actually my first publication with my first student, so things are coming along nicely. I've been able to take all the feedback from around the world and basically download it into this book, Everything We Know About Bees. It's been a great way for us to engage with the global community and also to engage with the scientists and to communicate our, dea our ideas about the future. The future for my research, for my lab, for my company, and for science remains bright. However, the future for bees remains opaque. And I need to go over this a little bit because in order to know where our future is going, we need to know where we've come from, right? 2006 was really when we first started seeing vanishing bees in the United States. This was called colony collapse disorder. It started in Pennsylvania when up to 100% of colonies at any given site not just died, but vanished, right? So this is like CSI B in a way. <laughs> the, this was mostly associated though with commercial beekeeping operations. So we saw most of the vanishing bee deaths on these commercial migratory beekeeping routes where Millions of beehives live on flatbed trucks. About half to a little bit more than half of all the honey beehives in America live on flatbed trucks these days. It's the state of our agricultural system where monocultures are grown by farmers and growers such as almonds in California. When those almond blooms are done around March or so every year, there's no more food for those bees and nothing else pollinates almonds. So honeybees have to get trucked out there in the millions, pollinate the almond blossoms, and once those blossoms are fallen, there's no other food there, and the bees have to then get back on the truck, and they'll go Pennsylvania, apples, Maine for the blueberries, Massachusetts for cranberries, and so forth. And this is the state of the current US agricultural system, and this is where we saw most of those deaths from colony collapse disorder. Today, it appears as though colony collapse disorder has ended. And I wrote a piece in the New York Times about this just last week. It might seem like big news, however, we're just finding the dead bodies now. It doesn't mean that bees are doing okay. We're still losing between 30 and 40% of our bees every year, and it's an unacceptably high number. We need these bees for their role as pollinators. Bees contribute over $15 billion to our US economy alone every year for their role as pollinators. $15 billion. And if you look around the globe, that's about $100 billion. So bees are important to our economy as well as, of course, to our ecology for their role as pollinators. But they pollinate over 100 different fruit and vegetable crops that we rely upon. We need them. We need to care and we need to push ourselves to know this. Maybe you're still not convinced. What about your everyday lives? What do you need for lunch or for breakfast? In a world with bees, such as we still have today, this is what a typical plate might look like. Without bees, we'll still have some food. However, it'll be pretty carby, as one might say. <laughs> We'll be eating a lot of carbs. We won't have as many colors. The fruits and vegetables, even the meats that much of our cattle eat, the fruits and vegetables that are pollinated by bees, that's gone too. So we'll still have some food. It just won't be very nutritious. And this has affected policy already. We have our first beekeepers in the White House these days. We also have other corporations in Washington, not far from the White House, that are putting bees on the rooftops, such as NPR, National Geographic, and many more. This helps to promote the sustainability image of companies. There are so many wins here across the board that we are seeing governments, such as in France, come up with incentives for residents to get bees. France has always been very forward-thinking. Even urban beekeeping started the Opera House in France. Compare that to places like Palm Springs, where you need to pay $2,000 per beehive for a conditional permit. Places like Nairobi, where I had the opportunity to travel, doing some nonprofit work, working with local beekeeping tribes. Nairobi, Kenya has this amazing program. They're educating beekeepers, training scientists in the city, creating jobs. Compare that to places like Miami, where there have been residents taken to court for having bees. 
And even just on Tuesday, I spent hours of my day talking with a law firm because a local city not far from here has served a cease and desist order to a school where the children are using bees to learn. If we look at Australia, we have a very great example of how bees are being used to create jobs, to further research by a national consortium of researchers. They get together, they learn from bees, and they're creating opportunities with them. The last other example might be in Los Angeles, where the policy is to murder upon sight. Not only is beekeeping illegal in Los Angeles, but it's kill, kill, kill. We must do better. Now, one night as I continued thinking about these problems and how we can change them, I found myself reading a paper, and maybe some of you come across a point in an article or a book that wasn't necessarily the title, it was just something else that stuck out. And this is something that really alarmed me. This particular image came from a paper out from the government last year by Jeff Pettis and colleagues. It's in a journal called PLOS One, and it's free for everybody to access. This figure shows that honeybees that are rented for pollination purposes and that migratory roots, when they're placed in monoculture crops, they're not always going to the crops that they're supposed to go to. A farmer can't tell a bee where she needs to go. The bee's gonna go where she wants to go. <laughs> and this tells us that the bees and honeybees are going to almonds and they're going to apples. They are not going to blueberries, cucumbers, cranberries, watermelons, pumpkins, you see where I'm going? That's not to say we don't have those foods though, right? So this is what I was thinking this late night, thinking, wow, this isn't even the point of the paper, it's just another figure here. The paper was about disease and chemicals, but here within lies the answer, because what's pollinating these crops? It's likely the other 20,000 or so species of bees that we know hardly anything about. Even here in America, we have about 4,000 species of bees. And this is where you come in, and this is what we can all do to help. So looking today also requires us to know where we've come from. Here is another image of a swarm of bees, typically in a tree, and a beekeeper will collect those bees. But then where do they go? It all comes down to this right here. Have you ever heard of bees living in walls, right? This is something that might come up in the news. 50,000 bees removed from a woman's wall or this family's home. It's very startling. It certainly is very startling. <laughs> However, did you know that these bees can heat the walls to 90 degrees in the wintertime? They can cool the walls to no higher than 90 degrees in the summertime? What if you were to run a pipe through that bee's nest and heat the whole house? Why are we getting rid of this? How much money are we spending on insulation every year when this is already happening for free <laughs> around the world. What if we even had beehives that are functional pieces of furniture? This is a beautiful table. At my place, my apartment in Dorchester, I use my beehive as a cocktail table. These are not aggressive bees. These are pollinators. These are vegans. These are not... <laughs> These are not their cousins, the wasps and the hornets. Those bees are carnivorous. I tend to think of them as steak knives with wings. These are not those. <laughs> they're protocols with everything with beekeeping, and they're many non-aggressive bees, and those are the ones we like to work with. Think about bee hotels. A hotel, a place to live, maybe temporarily, but you can create these with your family. Schools can do this. You can do this on a date night. Anybody can. <laughs> you put debris together in a box. Maybe you have some bricks, maybe you have some logs, maybe you have some wine corks. The other lesser known species of bees can create amazing nests. Check out this one in the right corner here. That's a leaf cutter bee. She cuts petals from flowers and then glues them together with a pollen and sticky nectar mixture. How beautiful is that? And then we even have these green iridescent sweat bees. There's so many different bees that we don't understand and they're playing a huge role in our economy and our food production. Even hotels for people are producing bee hotels like this, like the St. Ermin's Hotel in London. This helps the company's sustainability image in a very beautiful, designed, important, impactful way. Other places like this temple in Bhutan recognize, okay, these bees wanna live outside. That's okay, let's let them stay. 
It's another perspective. What if you had a home constructed like this? It allows bees to nest on the outside. You can live on the inside. Or if you had some wooden pallets you want to stack up like this, could make a beautiful table outside that's sustainable, right? What about a home in the future? What will future homes look like? Can we build homes so that bees want to move in and we want them to be there? Can we sustainably design homes in the future? Looking even forward, what else will our future with bees contain? This is a solitary bee. Now, I'm going to remind you back to Pavlov's experiments. Pavlov's dog, if you remember this. So we have a bit of conditioning here where, at least for the bee, similar to the dog, the dog might salivate when there's a bone and a bell ringing. So with a bee, we can train her to stick out her tongue like so, right? We'll pull that back in and stick it out just to demonstrate <laughs> that, okay? Now, in the presence of a food source, the bee might say, hmm, sugar water, I'm gonna stick out my tongue. Now, if you associate that sugar water with a scent, that bee will then learn to associate food with a scent. Right? And we're using this to train bees. This is showing at the top graph that over time, if you train a bee with this method three times, her memory remembers that odor for 72 hours. And that's better memory than just one time. So there's some repetition with how bees learn. Bees have memory. What if you train a bee for an odor and then put a tracking device on her and let her out to find something? How could that better the human condition? How is that pertaining to the future of humanity? One thing that's already happening is we're training non-honeybees to pollinate almonds. Only honeybees pollinate almonds, and honeybees are dying. The cost of almonds is already going up. What are we going to do? One USDA project is training bees that there's food at almonds. Go to the almonds. Now watch carefully. What if we change out the almond scent for something totally unrelated? Bombs, bomb-sniffing bees. <laughs> what if you trained a bee to find landmines, that there's food where landmines are, and then you sent 100 bees out to a field, let them go, and you see where they accumulate, and you find a landmine? What if you then kept the bees stationary? Picture maybe like a dust buster type device, if you're familiar with those, a handheld bee sniffing device. A bit futuristic, it is already happening. These bees are sitting in fancy chairs. They look a little futuristic, right? Maybe a march of the, the bees. But these are sensors that can detect when honeybees are sticking their tongues out. And this is being used in the context of airport security. Scanning bags. Maybe we won't have to take our shoes off one day. <laughs> if you think about a dog, that is a sample size of one. You see those sniffing bags. If you have 100 bees, you're increasing your accuracy, you're lowering your costs, and what's even best is that the bees can go back home after their eight-hour shift at work. <laughs> it's sustainable as well. So as I leave you off today, I want to make you think even more about the future and how our future with bees can help the human condition. Think about slums in Mumbai. There is a great group that is testing how bees can smell blood, not blood glucose levels through the breath. Diabetic patients sometimes don't have access to resources to keep their blood sugar under control, and if this device is taken to areas around the world where they don't have access to healthcare or to money to help out, this is already happening in Mumbai, in India. What about breathing into a container with bees to test for cancer, cancer-sniffing bees? What other diseases around the world and other problems and grand challenges can be solved with the future with bees? Thank you.